Okay, we have built our project. We've created our board class. We've created methods which test whether a partial solution is valid or not. And we've created a backtracking solver. Now what we need to do is we need to do the final work of connecting our user interface to the solver so that we get an application that works. So let's go back to our app, our app which is the Java FX component that um, runs our user interface. And let's go down here to where we created our solve button. Our solve button right now is just coloring some of our squares, but what we want our solve button to actually do is to go through and do the solution to our problem. So we're going to um, handle that solve event. When our solve button gets clicked, we're going to create a new solver. That's good. That'll help us to be able to solve our board, but then we actually need a board as well. All right. So in order to create a board, what we're going to need is we're going to need a board. <laughs> we'll call it we'll call it the partial board. And it'll start with nothing in it. But what we're going to then do is we're going to walk through each one of our user interface text fields and we are going to transfer the value from the text field into our board. So what we'll do is we'll create uh, an integer i that's made from Oh, let's see. I think this is the right way to do it. We'll take our text fields, sub C, sub R, and we will get the text, and we will trim it, take the white space off the beginning and the end, and we will try and convert that into an integer. And we're getting a problem here because it cannot be resolved to a type. Oh, it's not new, it's just value of. There we go. Okay, and we're passing it in. That's a string, great. And this can throw a number format exception. So what that means is that it's possible that the user didn't type a number into our field. And so we want to be able to handle that. So we're going to throw a try block around there. And we're going to catch a number format exception. So this means that we looked at that field. We tried to turn it into an integer. It didn't work. So it, we got an exception thrown for us. Let's see, number format exception. I just spelled it wrong. All right, and if that is the case, then we want our, uh, let's see, let's move our integer i outside of the try block. All right, try that again. And then in that case, then i is going to be equal to null. Actually, we don't have to do anything in that case because our board already starts with null. Okay, so we can move our integer back inside. If it didn't throw an exception, then we have a number. Then we just want to say that our partial board dot set. We want to set our column and our row. We want to set that equal to i. So this is just going to transfer all of the numbers that are actually numbers from our interface into our partial board. Once we have our partial board, we're going to go ahead and say, well, uh, we've got a partial board. Let's see if we can find a solution. So um, board solution is going to be equal to our solver s and say, please solve our partial board. And we know that if there is a solution, solution will be it. If it, there isn't a solution, then solution will be equal to null. So now we're going to update update the UI based on the result. All right. So we're going to go through each one of the positions on our board. And what we're going to do is we are going to say um, if it was a space. So we'll say if our text fields, like as it currently exists in our user interface, if what was there once we get rid of the white space, equals an empty string. Then we want to replace it with something. And then now we want to check if we had a good solution, or if, if we didn't have a good solution. So if it's null, then what we're going to do is we're going to set the style of that particular field, we'll set it equal to like a red color to indicate that there is no solution. So we'll set that equal to 255, 204, 204, kind of a red. 
But if there was a space and we did have a solution, then we're going to do two things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to set the color equal to something that's more green. So 204, 255, RGB, 204. And we're going to set that actual text field, the value in it, we're going to change it from being the space to being whatever we got back from our solution. So we'll make a string, and to that we will add our solution, get C, comma, R. All right, so we'll fill out our blank spot and we'll color it green. Okay, and if it was not a space in the beginning, then we're just going to make sure that the color is white. So if it was something that the user provided, we'll just get, put the background, make the background white. Get rid of that extra code. All right, and I think that's it. So now, okay, when we go to run our project, we're going to look at run configurations to make sure that we run the right thing. We're going to select the Sudoku one that comes by default out of there. I'm going to get rid of these. Whoa. I'm going to get rid of these other two so they're not confusing. They're from when I was setting up the project. Select this Maven one. I'm going to run it. And we're going to see that it doesn't launch our user interface. Instead, we get a bunch of errors. That's because we've got our testing code next to our production code. So up here, not under the, where the source code is listed, but where these files are listed, I'm going to open up source, and I'm going to make a new directory, a new folder under here called test. And I'm going to make a new folder under there called Java. And when we do that, you can see that a new source directory gets brought up here, and I'm going to move each one of my testing classes into that directory. That will prevent them from being run when I run my program. Once you have your tests in a separate testing directory, you can click on the project and you should be able to do coverage or run as a JUnit test. And everything, sh all your tests should still run and you'll see which code got covered. None of our application code got covered because our test didn't test our application. Now, for some reason that JUnit test didn't work as smoothly as what I just did, try doing the following things. Open up your project under Properties. Come to Java Build Path and go to your library, go to your source for starters, and take a look at this directory that you just created that contains the test code. And right here, make sure that it says contains test, test sources. You can toggle it no, toggle it yes, but you want it to be yes because this is a directory that contains tests. Um, and in contrast, this one up here does not contain tests. So we're moving our tests into our separate directory. So make sure that this one says yes. Then when you go to your libraries, you can select JUnit, open that one up. And right here where it says visible only for test sources, toggle that one so that it says yes. And that'll make it so that only those, only that code that is in source folders indicated that it contains test code will be able to see the JUnit 5 tests. Apply and close, and then when you run it, however you want to run it, configure as, JUnit tests, you should probably get a better outcome. Okay, well, those are our tests. Now let's test our application. So we're going to right click on application, and we will run that as a Java application. Save and build our directory using our Maven rules. Oh, sorry, I ran it using Eclipse. What I should have done is I should have come up here and ran it using our Maven run process. All right, we get our board. And so we can partially fill in our board, put some numbers in there, and hit solve. And what do we get? We get a, a good board. So let's clear that one. Or I guess that's a good board, so we solve it. So let's take a look and try and solve the one on the Wikipedia page. Okay, our Wikipedia page puzzle is here, and the black ones are the ones that came uh, with the puzzle, and the goal was to fill in the red ones. So let's see if we can match this. Seven, eight, nine, one, two. We get a six. And eight, and five, and nine, and seven. And if we hit solve, 
Boom, we get the solution, and it looks like it matches the solution that was provided by the Wikipedia page. So great. Now let's say that when we had tried to solve this, we didn't have a possible solution. So that would be, for example, if we had had a three there instead. And we can go through and delete all of our... So we know this one can't be solved. And so if we do hit solve, we'll see that the spots that can't be filled in are marked red. We delete our three and we can solve it again. Clear everything and just ask for everything to be filled in. We very quickly get a solution that's filled in. Well, good job. We were able to write a Sudoku solver in Java using those technologies that we talked about at the beginning, OpenJFX, Eclipse, JUnit testing along the way. I hope in doing this coding, you were able to see some of the strategies that are involved in doing a backtracking recursive solution to a problem. You also might notice that even though the core component of solving the problem was backtracking recursion, that actually was a small part of the code that we had to write. We had to have user interface components that both enabled the user to input the partially complete Sudoku board, and we had to do some feedback to provide feedback to the user about how well the solution worked or didn't work. And we had to have testing on top of that, and we had to build out an Eclipse project. So yes, the algorithmic component about backtracking is innovative and interesting, works for a lot of very interesting problems, but there's a lot of other stuff that's required in order to get a working program going. So I hope you enjoyed this tutorial series. I hope you learned something. Swing by my channel to find other opportunities to learn stuff on YouTube. Thank you.